Welcome to Rolling Out University's Design and Dialogue. My name is Chandler Malone. I'm the founder of The Family Studios. And today I'm joined by our most recent investment, Tony Sims. Tony, thanks for having us, or thanks for coming and joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me, man. I'm super excited. So tell us a little about yourself, man. What are you working on? Um, you know, the most recent company that you've launched and, you know, how'd you get there? Yeah, well, um, hey, everybody. My name is Tony Sims. I am uh, 23 years young. Uh, I am a student at Washington University in St. Louis, major in entrepreneurship. Um, had a background in music for a while and essentially just give like the whole story of, you know, growing up, my uh, uncles used to be the ones DJing around at family events, you know, around the city and such. And all the cousins would kind of be around the table watching them. Um, eventually, once we got old enough to even like manage the the equipment, they were like, hey, y'all do this. So we started getting uh, picking up some of the gigs at like as soon as we were like, honestly, 11, 12, 13. Um, from there, I kind of fell in love with the actual music production, like the math behind music production. Um, around the same time that like DJ Mustard had his whole West Coast run, um, yeah, you know, whole like you know 98, 99, 100 beats per minute uh, time. So for me, it was just kind of like really cool to see it from the mathematical perspective. Um, so I got into music production, really owned in on Fruit Loops, uh, Mytho Studio. You know, uh, really kind of got an understanding of like how to go about building, creating beats. You know, taking the idea from inside of my head into the to the I guess canvas in a sense. Um, and then of course me just being the the young hustler I am, <laughs> I decided to go ahead and start my first business which is called Tony Sims Productions. Essentially, that was like a multimedia production company. Um, and we focused on creating music with artists in Memphis, um, putting their music on DSP, such as Apple, Spotify, et cetera, um, doing music videos with them, helping them like do social media runs, really just kind of creating some buzz around their name um, in, in the Memphis area. Um, through that, I was blessed enough to be invited by the Recording Academy uh, to join one of their summer camps called the Grammy Camp. Basically, if you've ever seen High School Musical, it's, it's basically like that. Uh, or not High School Musical, sorry, Camp Rock is basically like that. Like, there's a bunch of talented people coming together um, in the studios in Nashville. Uh, we really went down, like, all, all of Music Row and the, the top top studios and got to work with some great people in the industry um, for that week. But for me, that was my first foray into, like, the actual business side, you know, outside of what I did in Memphis, um, which was super, super exciting. Um, fast forward a little bit, I get into WashU uh, with a great scholarship by the grace of God. So then I said, let's focus on academics for a second and we'll come back to, to this music entertainment space when we have more time. Um, through that, entrepreneurship is a really big thing at WashU. Uh, we have a great undergrad program and I kind of got thrown in really quickly as like being the guy for pitches um, when it came to like pitch competitions and stuff. You know, some people would be sending like, you know, uh, videos I film on their iPhone uh, of their like, two minute pitch, but I had a whole <laughs> 4K setup studio style thing. Like it was one of those things where if people saw my pitch, they were like, like is, is this guy, like, is he actually, like, who's he hiring to do this? You know, like it was that type of quality. Um, so that really got me a lot of buzz on campus. And through that, I was able to kind of get connected to a lot of the top tier um, entrepreneurs here, both um, in residence and also professors. And uh, through that, I kind of got my first like foray into the startup space and honestly fell in love with that kind of like whole game in a sense, too. Um, and then from there, you know, last or I guess the top of this year, I started monitoring the AI space when it came to music. Um, saw how people react into the AI covers. And then, of course, that um, AI song Heart of My Sleeve came out and people were going crazy for it. Um, but, you know, during that time, I realized like, oh, there may be an inflection point here to figure out if there's a uh, space in consumers um, wallet to go and want to spend time on a platform dedicated solely for AI streaming. Um, so that was like that first little run that we did. It's called Apollo. Basically, we um, started as like the Spotify for AI music, but now what we're realizing is that there's a way bigger opportunity here to really just be the future of music um, and to bring this AI technology not only on the creative side, but also just on the managerial side and honestly all over what uh, music is and to really help advance that spot. So ideally five, 10 years from now, if anyone wants to wake up one morning and says, hey, I really want to get into the music space, then they know exactly where to go to to get there. And, and that's the ultimate vision with it. Love it, man. Um, your story is super inspiring, right? Like, I feel like you've accomplished so much, you know, over the past 10 years, like a lifetime. <laughs> Um, thank you, thank so you. tell me like from a mentality standpoint, right? It seems like you're the type of person that doesn't really have, you know, any doubts about, you know, going and doing the, th the thing, even if it's not, you know, kind of on the most traveled path. Where does that come from? You know, like, where does that confidence, where does that courage come from? Um, well, I think I think it's it's a couple of things. The first thing is that, like, I kind of grew up in a very um, well-structured household. Like my mom and my mom and dad, mom was a school teacher. Um, all my life and my dad was a blue collar worker and just seeing how they were able to like hustle and get their their stuff together to have a, a good life for me and my brother is like that first like oh you know even if you got to get out of the mud in a sense like you should have the mentality that you can accomplish anything that you put your mind to right 
Um, so that's that first thing. The second thing is really just like understanding how important it is for to be like a startup founder in a sense. Like one of the things that I've kind of fallen in love with recently is realizing that whatever I'm imagining um, is a good idea for like a startup. Um, in reality, what I'm saying is like, hey, in five years, I imagine the world would be using whatever I'm thinking is, is a good idea, right? And now that you see this ripe space for innovation in the AI area, you're like, oh, I understand that the conversation now is who can help us bring this technology into our like everyday lives, but in a way that's like ethical in the right way. And like, for me, that's the whole thing about this. Like, I really want to make sure that we can start consuming music in a way more ethical, way more um, advantageous, but also way more just um, democratized way. Like everywhere, everyone should be able to have some sort of ability to get into the music space and be able to make money from it and then not feel like you have to just be the top dog. Yep. Yep. And and so maybe take me through how some of your past experiences have just educated, you know, what you want to build specifically for artists, you know, at Apollo. Yeah. Um, for me, it's just like I, I was down there working with these artists um, and I see like the, the biggest struggle is trying to figure out how to get your foot in. You know, like a lot of times people are thinking that we need to go and have a hit song off of TikTok and like that is one way. But a lot of these artists that like actually get tapped to get into the industry, like a lot of them are have these connections already. So it's at the end of the day, it's really like a networking community type of thing. Right. Um, and for me, you, you know, working with those artists, it was like, all right, if, if there was like this centralized place where I can go and stream this person's music and also be able to like build a fan base around that um, while providing them the tools to do. It just seems like it's that's the most logical way of helping streamline this entire process. Um, so, yeah, it really was just working with these artists and understanding like what their actual pain points are. Yeah. And so uh, talk to me a little bit more about just the current state of things at Apollo. Right. Are there, you know, any new developments that you'd like to share or, you know, any growth, you know, that you'd like to you know share with the audience? Yeah, Chandler, I'm going to be honest with you, man. I've been telling this to all the angels and the investors we've been talking to. Um, this thing is moving so fast that I can't even slow it down right now. And like I'm so grateful to be in this position. Um, but it's just like it, it lets you know like, we're not even a month old. Right. We launched officially the, the, the first version of it on April 20th. And it's not even that yet. Like once this goes live, I think it'll be around that time. But like that still, we're just, we're just 30 days into this. Right. Um, so be able to see the progress so far. Like we, we have assembled a star studded cast of angels. And like, I mean that in like every literal sense, um, like these names are like, I would never be imagined imagine having conversations with these people and, and, and them being interested and committed to like saying, yeah, I'm in like, let me know what else needs to be done. Um, so these people are the people in the, the entertainment space, sports space, uh, music industry, like we really are being strategic with this. Um, so that's like the big development is that we just have a lot of the the people that we want to have interested, interested. Um, and then also, you know, my whole thing was why go through the same struggles that Napster went through? Why go through the same struggles that LimeWire went through in this time where we already clearly know what that solution can look like, you know, in the Spotify's and the Apple Music's and stuff. Um, and part of my thing is, you know, why, why deal with all that issue when you can actually be building with the industry rather than building for the industry, right? So the, the idea here is to partner, build, and launch versus build, launch, and then partner for the sake that that results in a lot of legality stuff that we really don't want to deal with and don't have to deal with. Quite frankly, no one from the music industry and no one from the tech space really wants to even get into that whole, like, all right, they're suing us. We got to do this, got to do that. Like if we build with them, this is going to be the, the, the solution that actually sticks from the jump, right? Because we're talking with the customer in a sense. Um, and with that, you know, that was a hypothesis two weeks ago. And now I can honestly say that um, the hypothesis is true because we have just uh, closed a partnership with um, a very strong um, independent record label um, and, you know, disclosing the names and stuff later. But um, this this is really one of those things where you can tell that the music industry is eager to figure out how to fix this and how to solve this problem. Um, and the early buy in again, this is not even a month old, that early buy in from everyone involved is is crucial. And we're getting that. So, yep. I mean, I think you can tell right just from your energy and the conversation that things are moving really fast for you. But, <laughs> you know, when you just talk about some of the specific things that have happened and are happening right over the past month, it seems like your day to day life has changed like quite a bit. Yeah. So maybe take me through like what that's been like and like how you've been, you know, adjusting to the changes. Yeah. Um, well, I guess the first thing is that like this is something that I've experienced to an extent. Um, so last semester, I actually took that semester off and was in New York uh, working on my last startup. And through that process, I was really like getting an understanding of how that startup life looked, you know, having these meetings, talking to these investors and stuff. And it was like honestly dipping my toes into the water for a quick second to understand what that you know space looked like. Um, for me, though, in this situation, it really has happened so fast. And it started in the middle of finals <laughs> that like, 
it really has been, all right, I hop on a meeting with this investor, I hop on a meeting with this angel, and then I got an hour to write this paper that's due like at the end of the day, right? And then I got to jump from that to another meeting and then like, okay, cool, now I got to pack my room up really quickly so we can head out of SF and meet these labels. And it's like, all right, now I'm back in St. Louis. So it's it's this really, time hasn't stopped um, and it feels like that I can't stop it. So like my day-to-day is really just meeting some type of meetings, talking to artists, talking to the people who are creating this music, talking to the label literally just trying to make sure that all these ducks are in a row for the sake that I know that that is what this path should look like. Yeah. Yeah. No. And so take me through what you think, you know, like these next, you know, six to nine months are going to look like, you know, for you, yeah. do you have any just vision of that? Yeah. Um, so next six to nine months, um, the vision here is that we'll be fully launched. Um, we'll be working. We're, we're going to be building in public. That's one of the things that we've realized is the best strategy here. Um, we need to go ahead and capture the market of the people who are listening and wanting to listen to the AI music currently so that we can house them onto our platform. Um, and then from there, uh, we're in the process of developing um, these AI creator tools. Um, part of the AI, when you think about AI creator tools, I don't want anyone to misconstrue that into thinking that it's solely just the the tools to be able to take an artist's voice and be able to build a model around it and then like be able to replace it with their voice. Like that's not the sole tool here. Uh, what we realize is that AI can be used to help in every process of the music creation. Um, such as the writing, such as the engineering, such as the actual production of it, from the beats to the mixing, et cetera. So those are all those tools that we're going to be working on and bringing to market over the course of these next six to, to nine months. Um, you brought up a really interesting point, right, about just, you know, some of these AI tools around, you know, duplicating voice, you know, or, yeah. or copying, you know, someone else's voice. Um, you also mentioned, right, you know, having a, a partnership, right, with a, a very large label. Um, could you maybe share a little bit, you know, what you're hearing labels say from the conversations that you've had, um, you know, about some of these AI tools and just kind of like what their thoughts have been so far? Yeah. Um, well, the, the, the main thing that I'm seeing right now is that the conversations are definitely turning away from the, oh, my goodness, this AI here. Like, what is this, this is going to be bad to, OK, how can we incorporate this in the form of an instrument in a sense? Right. Um, we've seen these advances in the, the software space when it comes to music creation happen over the past 20, 25 years. Um, of course, we have those, you know, staples such as the Pro Tools and the FL Studios that have been around for a while. But like what, what I'm also realizing is that a lot of these people in the music space are equating this whole AI music stuff to the same thing as like when we first saw Autotune come come about. Right. Like the idea of modulating your vocals to sound differently from what they naturally sound like isn't a new concept. It's just now that we're seeing, oh, we've gotten to the point with technology where we can take vocal models of other people and then place them on top of other vocals, right? Um, and I think for that, it's it's that's really the, the the turn of the conversation now is how can we use this as a tool rather than seeing it as like a, a culprit to the creation process, um, which is you know a hunch that I had from the jump, but seeing and hearing that from the people in the industry is really 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 uh, comforting to know like okay we're accepting and embracing this. And and you know I think. It's been it's great to hear that the industry is, you know, accepting and embracing it. But you going into these meetings, right, you don't necessarily know that that's going to be the case. Yeah. And so, you know, take me through, you know, how it's been having these conversations, you know, walking in with a new technology and you don't know what the reception is going to be. You know, if folks are going to be excited about it. If folks are going to be you know, afraid and how you're able to get that buy in. Yeah. Well, the first thing is just understanding who the key stakeholders in the situations are like. Um, for us at Apollo, we see the key stakeholders being the record labels and artists, um, the creators of the music currently, so there's AI music, and then the listeners, right? And understanding exactly where they are at at this conversation um, is crucial for us to know how we should be presenting ourselves in these conversations, right? So clearly listeners are wanting to listen to this content. You can see this on where it's currently housed, you know, sporadically on YouTubes and the SoundClouds. Um, and on Apollo. Um, you can also like see that listeners want to communicate and talk about this with other people. So that social aspect is really crucial as well. Um, when it comes to artists and labels, what we're understanding is that, you know, there is still a disconnect to an extent about who should be having this conversation and who that conversation should be had with. Right. Um, and so for me, it's I want to go into these meetings with these people and basically give them the open the open canvas, the free slate to be able to talk about whatever they want to talk about. Because um, ultimately, that's how you can really understand where they're at with these things. Um, again, the conversation has gone from, oh, my goodness, this is a fad, this is hype, this is a trend, to, okay, now that we see that, you know, other players like the Googles are coming in and bringing in these small little tools for the music production space, this isn't a fad, this is a long-term thing. So, like, now it's, hey, 
what are you guys looking for? How do you guys see this fit into your day-to-day life as an artist, as a label? And then tell me from there. And having those conversations really opening it up to, to understanding where they want to, to incorporate this into their day-to-day lives is crucial to understanding how this actually can work, right? Um, so really it's been, hey, how do you guys feel about this space? What's going on for you guys behind the scenes? Like, what are y'all's biggest concerns? How do you guys see this fitting into it? And letting them tell us what that looks like is crucial for us to understand what to build a solution around. Yeah, no, I love that. I love just how customer centric your approach, you know, has been. And I think also, you know, anyone listening can tell that you've got a really deep level of knowledge of, you know, both the industry, you know, how these new technologies, you know, are being, you know, accepted and implemented. Um, And so, you know, with that being said, right, you've got a plan, you know, to actually go, you know, bring this to life. Tell us a little bit more, you know, about the team that you've currently got, you know, or, you know, individuals that you're looking, you know, to potentially join your team, you know, in the future as well. Yeah. Um, so the biggest thing in this, the startup space is as a first time founder in this sense, um, you really want to make sure that you're equipped with the best amount of tools to be able to you know, see that that process through. Um, for me, this is happening so fast that I knew I needed to go and try to assemble like an Avengers like team to be able to accomplish this. Um, so I can say that on the team building side, that's what we're doing. Um, I have people who are seasoned um, entrepreneurs in the space who've gone through the venture um you know, fundraising process to help me navigate that. Angels as well has been such a very crucial thing for me is like to find those angels who really just support the idea of what we're trying to do, but also understand like, hey, you know, as a young black founder in this space, it's crucial to have that type of network, that village around you to kind of help you get through this because it literally, you know, is is so rare for even me to be in a situation like this, right? Um, so the angels and all, all again, alongside building that that Avengers like team uh, for us, you know, the, the biggest priority right now is filling in those gaps when it comes to the technical aspect of things. For me, technical person already, like I've been coding since I've been in eighth grade. Uh, but like, you know, I, this isn't a one man show type of thing. Right. So we're in the process of finding some top tier engineers um, who have been in the music space um, alongside, you know, legal and everyone else who also has just been able to navigate. And again, like I said, the, the, the current status right now is that I couldn't be more blessed to have this this team being assembled currently so love it love it and um you know take us a little bit through the fundraising right i feel like you know that's happening very quickly for you um but at the same time a lot of people have so much difficulty um you know when it comes to that especially black and brown founders um and so talk to me you know how has fundraising been and you know what do you think has made it so successful for you um, I think I think two things. One is that um, the the first thing that made this successful is the timing. I will say that um, there really is something about being able to have that sixth sense in a sense where you can like be able to understand what a good opportunity looks like and then be able to pounce on that opportunity at the right moment. And I feel like in this situation, I just happen to catch that, that at the right time. Right. Um, you know, everyone is really talking about AI in this space. We see the recent developments. Like if you go on Twitter, literally every other set of news is going to be around AI, whether it's the good news, the bad news or the ugly news. Um, so everyone's really looking to the space. And I think uh, in this situation, it's just been I've been able to find that niche of people who understand the value that comes along with having um, someone who is young, vibrant and new in the startup space to kind of lead this movement when it comes to AI and music, but also someone who's a person of color, honestly. Like there are just a bunch of nuances that are, are you know, as I have more conversations with people, I understand like there's small little disconnects that like I feel like only people of color would understand how that could fit into to issues. For example, um, one of my biggest things is like, who's to say that if this isn't, if this AI music isn't housed in one area we can kind of monitor it, that we don't get like a weird AI, you know, trap song where like an artist is causing beefs with other artists and it's all just AI generated, right? And how, how do we go about preventing that from happening for the sake that, you know, in the, the hip hop and rap community, that could be like, a, the, you know, the instance between like a life or death situation, unfortunately, right? And it's like, for me, I'm thinking about how to make sure that that is built into the platform as just a, a normal thing rather than like a, a thing we have to do, um, retroactively instead of proactively. So um, those are like the small things that I definitely can tell people pick up on. And it's like, okay, cool. We want to help support this per- person, this young man, be able to make it to that next step. Um, and that really has been the catalyst for this entire fundraising process. It's been, hey, let's get this man in front of as many people as possible because what he's doing is cool. It's needed. And on top of that, like we support him both from the the time aspect, but also the financial aspect. Yeah, no, and I mean, I, I think that's a really interesting uh, point that just needs to be highlighted, right? You look at a lot of the innovation, even within the tech community, um, that really, you know, impacts us culturally. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of times it's not us that's actually like being able to build it um, and shape it and, and what it looks like. And so I definitely, you know, commend you, you know, quite a bit, you know, for being able to 
not just be a consumer, right? But also be a creator of like these culture content platforms. Um, I guess next question I have for you, right? Is like fundraising has been going well. Do you have advice, um, you know, for other founders who are early in their fundraising journey, um, you know, in terms of just things that helped you? Yeah. Um, the first thing is that uh, the number one rule of fundraising is that you're always fundraising, even when you're not. Um, and for me, I heard that back, like maybe, you know, in October of last year. And it was like, I, 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 that makes sense. That makes sense. Right. And then now I'm seeing, oh, you know, that that makes total sense. Um, and, and what that basically means is that even in the moments where you walk into spaces where, you know, there are people who are connected to other people, you're fundraising, like you're talking, you're the first thing you have to pitch to an investor is yourself. And the best way to pitch yourself to someone is to have someone else actually pitch, your, pitch them to you. Right. Um, so that's the biggest thing I've realized is like I've been fundraising this entire time. I've been networking, talking to people, getting understanding of who is connected to who um, and understanding how to build those relationships. So that's the first key thing. Start building relationships, relationships with people who are in these spaces. Um, the second thing is that understand like you, you can there, there's subtle signs that you should be able to pick up on to tell you how you should approach a firm or a VC or an investor. Right. Um, the first thing you look at is how much money are they actually handling at the moment and how much have they already deployed? You know, how much dry capital do they still have? And dry capital is literally just money that they have to deploy for the rest of the, the fund that they've raised. Um, based off of that, you also look at their team size. You know, if they're on the smaller size of the team, then you, you can understand that the best way that they source deals is by having other people help them find those deals who are closer towards these startup founders. If they're a big team and they have a lot of money, typically they have an accelerator program of some sort, which might be the best way to go ahead and get in front of them. Um, and in that sense, the networking aspect is to figure out who's in charge of these accelerators, who's the people that are vetting them, and then being able to find a way to connect to them, right? Um, sometimes you may see um, some of these bigger firms or mid-size firms with like a smaller team do air tables. Um, and honestly, those are really the most strategic ways is to go through Airtable and then make sure that you have someone that has referenced you or have someone that said, hey, you should like talk to such and such over here and then make sure that you mention them in that Airtable. Um, ideally, ultimately, again, the, the, the best way to have yourself pitch to an investor is to have someone pitch on your behalf. And that can look in the form of, you know, a cold intro or like a warm intro um, or something as easy as like, again, having a reference point of like, oh, you know, such and such. Well, that person told me about you guys. Got you. And so I think it's super clear just listening to you talk, right? You've got a very deep level of knowledge when it comes to just all things like getting a startup from zero to one, right? Where have you been able to pick up this knowledge? Where have you gone to be able to expose yourself to information to, you know, be able to build networks early on in life? Yeah, well, the first thing is um, here at Wash U, um, currently that's where I'm located right now. <laughs> um, but for us, we just have a very strong entrepreneurship program. And um, the big, big name guy here, his name is Doug Vilhard. Um, and he is like, you know, one of the guy, he's basically steering the entrepreneurship program in the direction where like it can be a standalone school to an extent. Um, and through that process, he's been able to help a lot of us network and, and meet these other cool people in this space. Um, you know, WashU is known for Jim McKelvey as well. He is the uh, one of the co-founders of Square. And on top of that, he's in the process of working on these other companies as well. So he's heavily invested in the space. Um, another person I want to shout out to is Maxine Clark. She's the founder of Builder Bear. And she also has been one of those people that have been really, 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 really advantageous about trying to get a lot of these underrepresented founders in front of more people. And again, all of that is literally these reference points, right? So all they have to do is just tap their network and say, hey, do you know such and such? Okay, cool. If not, I want to introduce you to this person. And then that's how these things start. So for me, it really has been um, able to like root myself in the WashU entrepreneurship ecosystem. And then from there, branch out into these other spaces that understand, oh, he's a young founder who's trying to get something going. Let me find people who are also doing that same thing. And then from there, you network. So, you know, you talked about a number of very high profile uh, mentors who have had an incredibly high level of success over the course of their life. Obviously, for people like that, there are going to be a ton of people who want to get in touch with them, who want to develop a relationship with them. What were things that you did that made you actually be able to stand out and made them actually want to engage with you, you know, as well? Um, I think I think the first thing is that um, if anyone wants to get into the startup space just to make money, then you, you don't need to be in this space. Right. Like that is that's one of the things you learn early on. And I think that that is also articulated through how you move when you meet these people. People can pick up on if you're just really in this space just to make a bunch of money and that's it. For me, I, from the jump, have always been interested in startup space, like I said earlier, for the fact that like I can help improve the lives of a lot of people very, very quickly. And whatever idea I have in my head, 
I see that being the future. And if I can articulate to the, articulate that to other people and they also believe it, then it's like, okay, this person's in it for this reason, not that reason, right? Um, so the way that I've just been always moving in these conversations is letting people know my heart is is in the you know startup experience, is being a founder, is helping people rather than going to make money. And that's the first thing I think people p- pick up on. Um, secondly is like, don't ask for anything early on. Like that, that is one of those things that I've learned is like you walk into these spaces the first time, you're not in there to ask for like, you know, money or, or guidance or mentorship. You're in there just to like be known and have conversations with these people, right? And typically if they like you, they're gonna, they're gonna offer that for you. And again, the best way uh, to, to, to get anything going is to have that other person offer it for you because that's how these conversations really, really get started, right? So for me, it was, as I started meeting these people, it's like, hey, I just really want to, you know, gain as much information in the space as possible and like would love to like pick your brain at a couple of things, but that's really it. And they're like, yeah, this is great. Let me talk to you. I want to be able to pour into you the same way that someone poured into me. So you've had a ton of success, right? But at the end of the day, we know that everything isn't just all the highlights. Um, so could yeah. you <laughs> compare like some of the most difficult, you know, pieces of this process, whether it's been about work, whether it's been about relationships, really anything that someone who's an aspiring founder should, you know, be kind of like on the lookout for um, in terms of rough patches that comes with this? Yeah, um, I think I think the biggest thing recently has just been like understanding that there still is a game to play to an extent. Like for me, this entire process was, okay, if I can like try to like, you know, 10x my reach in certain things and that should be able to allow me to go faster. And like, there's a point where you do have to go by like the, the rules in a sense of like the VCs people have to go through the process of talking to people, their LPs, figuring out if it fits into their actual, um, you know, ability to invest in the company, et cetera, et cetera. And like that whole process, seeing that real time has been like, ah, like that's a kind of, you know, frustrating to see how, how that can take time, right? So having patience, but also understanding how to like use that time as, as a way to, to fill in those gaps that you need to fill in. Um, so first thing is really time management is understanding how to do that. Um, secondly, I think the, the biggest is difficulty in, in general is just having that belief in yourself, honestly. Like at the end of the day, the moment that I stop running this race, everyone else behind me stops, right? And like just having the understanding that you know that you have the power to turn it on and turn it off. Um, and then also knowing that you need to keep it on in order to keep going. It's like another thing too, because this thing doesn't slow down. You know, as soon as I'm done with this call, I'm hopping into some meetings to like brainstorm about what the next steps look like once we go into this area. Right. I'm figuring up, figuring out how to like close certain deals and get, keep the, these things going. And like that is a process that requires a lot of energy. And again, going back to the time management aspect, like you have to be able to manage that time so that you can do that. Yep. And on the energy piece, like obviously this is a ton of work, you know, to get anything off the ground and go from zero to one. What are things that you're doing to kind of protect your energy to, you know, make sure that you're in a place where you have ample energy, right, for the long haul and the long run of this journey? Yeah. Um, the first thing is that I had to figure out what was draining my energy in the moments that I needed to still be there. And for me, it's anxiety. I just have really bad anxiety. Right. And part of my anxiety comes from not knowing how certain spaces operate. So like for me, I see a pattern. I want to hyper fixate on it. I want to hyper analyze it to understand exactly what that pattern is. But if you've never seen something before, you're sitting there like, oh, like there's I have blinders on to an extent. Right. And for me, it's if that causes my anxiety, let me figure out how to remove those blinders as much as I can. And part of that process has been bringing on people around me who know what that looks like. Right. For me, the biggest wall in this entire process was what is the record labels and these artists in the industry actually think about this space, right? And the fact that we now have had conversations and have struck partnerships with these people allows me to be able to reduce that anxiety because now I know what's behind that wall, right? Um, so for me, it's been like, how do I go ahead and, and reduce that anxiety as much as I can by putting people around me that understand the spaces that I don't understand just yet? Yep, no, I love that. I love that. I think that's super smart. Um, one of the things that you talked about, right, is it's super clear that you've got you know an incredible vision for this but also building right for your customers, right? Building with the record labels in mind, um, you know, requires some stepping out of your own vision and, you know, kind of like understanding like what your potential customers, you know, want. Take me through how that process has been in terms of balancing your vision with, you know, the customer's like needs and desires. Well, yeah, I mean, ultimately the vision is always going to change based off the customer's needs and desires. Um, I think for me, what I've been able to do in the situations, I've been able to have like a broad but still you know, specific enough vision in the sense that we want to be the future of music where like it can encapsulate anything that the future of music looks like. So like as soon as we talk to a label and they say, oh, well, actually, we're imagining this being done this way because we feel like it fits into our things this, this, this way. Right. It's like, OK, cool. 
now this future of music looks like that because that's what you're telling me the future of music looks like, you know? So really for me, it's been able to, to keep that high level vision on top, understand that at the end of the day, no matter what we're doing, the future of music looks like being able to, to create the best process for creation and distribution of music. Okay, cool. Now that we understand those two pillars, how does the rest of this fit into play? And honestly, it's again, telling the people telling us what they want to see and what they want to do um, has been the crucial thing. Yep. Love that. Love that. And so, um, you know, as we kind of wrap up here, um, obviously a ton of aspiring founders, you know, watching this, do you have any, you know, parting words of advice, uh, you know, or encouragement for folks at all? Yeah. Um, the first thing is honestly, whatever you want to do, they feel like you need to do, go ahead and do it. Um, you know, you're never too young. I'm just grateful that I was able to get into this position early on, but a lot of people that I'm like talking to, like, I can already tell you now that I'm going to walk into rooms. I'm probably going to be the youngest person there, which means that the average person's age is going to be, you know, upwards in the 30 area. Right. And that's okay. Like, Ultimately, you should be able to do what you want to do when you want to do it. And if you put your best foot forward, take it day by day, you're going to make progress. Uh, one of the things that I've, I've heard that's been super helpful is literally just like one foot after the other, like you're walking on a tightrope. Don't think about the end. You know where the end is located, right? Ultimately, all you need to do is just make sure the next foot that you place down is, is good and it's firm and you know what the next step is going to look like after that. Um, that's been the, the biggest thing that's been helping me day by day. Um, and then also lastly, really, is just Again, as a startup founder, you have the ability to pitch what you think the future is going to look like. And as long as you're trying to do that the right way, people are going to support you at the end of the day. Like if you if they can people, humans can sense when something is good versus something is bad and what the tensions are. So if you can just make sure that you're putting your best foot forward and make sure that you're bringing your idea to fruition the right way, it's, it's going to work. People are going to support you. You're going to have that people behind you. So love that. Love that encouragement for everybody. And so, um, you know, how can folks get in touch with you? Uh, you know, how can folks find you, you know, online if they're interested in learning more about Tony, if they're interested in learning more about Apollo or really anything you're involved with? Yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn, Twitter um, and Instagram also and TikTok, all with Tony Sims, uh, some variation of that, maybe Tony Sims II, the second. Um, but yeah, find me on, on Instagram at Tony Sims II, on TikTok at Tony Sims II, Twitter, Tony Sims II, <laughs> um, and then LinkedIn is just Tony Sims. Cool. And then, um, you know, anywhere where we can kind of keep uh, up to date or track updates with Apollo? Yeah, um, you can go on Twitter, also stream at Apollo, um, and then also on our website, www.streamapollo.com. Um, like I said, we're moving so fast that I can't even slow down at this point. So the, the platform will be live soon for everyone to be able to consume on the app stores as well. So super excited. Awesome. Love it. Tony, thank you so much for joining us today, man. Thank you. Thank you, man.